Uh, I'll give you a little tour yeah, um, of our little, and I think me and Dad have both agreed this is our best one yet. Um, this is a view out of, we've got the penthouse suite here. We're in a tiny little country cottage place. It's called Villa Manila in Belgium. And the sun's just going down here, which is quite nice, but yeah, we like it. A lot. It's quite quiet. Okay, well, you're going to start off, I think, Joe, with oh, um, the nature of the camp. Obviously, we went to the site where the camp was the other day, and we stood by the river, and then we went up to the memorial. It was Ian who said, if you uh, download Google Earth, it will pinpoint where it was. So that's where me and Dad followed. That's what we went to the river as close to that as we could get. And then, obviously, we found the memorial. And then later on, I've now added a friend on my Hello, Facebook, Facebook page. She's called Sylvia. I hope I've pronounced that right. She's got her own Facebook page, which is absolutely amazing. So anybody who is after finding anything else about XXB, I highly recommend her page because just reading through her stuff, her page specifically for XXB is called Forgotten Heroes. Mm. Commando of Stalag XXB in Mielens Millerads, and I have no idea how to say that either. It was a good effort, Joe. Probably well out though. Yeah. But bless her heart, she emailed me last night with another pile of information. It's, it's just great how much um, input we're getting from people. But one of the pieces of information that we've um, uh, obtained from her is that that camp actually held 33,000 men. So it got me thinking about how big this camp must have been to hold that many people. It was sprawling. It was sprawling. So mm. last night um, before bed, I put a pinpointer where me and Dad went, uh, went down to the river. I put a pin at the uh, site of the memorial, because we know that the area they built that memorial on was, you know, the, the, the camp was there, and put a pin where Google Earth says XXB was. I'll, I shall add the photo on at some point underneath this where I've added the points. But actually, a, a rough guesstimate, I'd say that was probably about two miles, if you look at the scale at the bottom of the Google map two miles possibly by about one mile high obviously we're gonna sort of look into things like this more thoroughly as time goes by but yeah just off my of our own thing Thirty three thousand is the population 000. of a town it's it's got to be uh, big and it's, it was it was huge it covered all of what was then marienburg yeah which is now Moorbock. so the, the 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 british pow's and various other nationalities of pow's filled the whole place and I think we mentioned yesterday, didn't they? they used to go out on work parties as far away as 100 kilometres. Mm. Uh, so it was huge, huge. Um, and we've also d discovered uh, some of the work party work. They would just go out and do general jobs as, as well as Dad. We spoke about yesterday getting up at half past six to go and milk cows, which... Mm. Uh, Put him in good stead for his job later on which was news agent and getting up early and delivering newspapers so we'll come now to the last letter that we brought uh, from dad and this is the last of our journey we'll be doing one more installment tomorrow which will be covering dad's home life recovery and home life and the rest of his life so just and how how the whole war impacted dad but here's his last letter of the war dated the 5th of september 1944. Now I want you to hear Dad's heart as he wrote this letter. Dear darling, here's hoping that these few lines will reach you okay and express the hopes of mine that you are still safe and sound. I have not heard of you for a long time now, over two months. I am very worried. Please get me home soon, darling. I'll show you the letter there, a very short letter, and if you've been listening to the letters as, been, as we have been reading them through uh, tour, through the week, yeah. um, you're 
see that Dad's mood was uh, falling as he was going through camp life. Uh, he was enjoying camp life, milking cows and planting seeds Ooh. and so on. We come now to the conditions in the, in the camp, uh, conditions on the march home rather. Mm -hmm. And these, these were pretty grim, but before we do, before we do that, we'll, we have spent an awful lot of time, I've spent hours just this week um, while I've been driving, plotting while Joe's been driving, <laughs> I've been sitting there. I've got the scenery. Oh yeah, what scenery? <laughs> and I've been looking at the map. Oh, it's just Joe. I've but, put me uh, back in the map Joe. again. So we discovered that. Now I don't know if I can show you. Now, this is going to be very difficult to show, but we probably could later on when we do a much better job of this. Yeah, let's see if we can um, make a, right. a map. Oh. Now, Dad was in. We discovered, I can't see Dad, hold on. Yeah, we discovered at length that Dad was in Molbok, which is there. Told all the messages are in the way, Joe, but yeah, you can't read those. Yeah. And he was walked, marched down, now if I can find a place on the map, uh, actually go over the page, and there was Stalag Luft 4. And all the prisoners from... Uh, Stalag XXB march that whole distance. Perhaps you can get an idea if you look like that. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. From there, there. to Stalag Luft 4. Oh. And then so there. they all marched together from Stalag Luft 4, which was there, down through, we suspect, uh, Stettin, which was Stettin, Stettin at the time. So it's quite a few hundred miles. There's already hundreds of miles of then. And the the chap who was writing the book that I spoke to you about yesterday, uh, The Last Escape, said that the men were arriving there already fairly bedraggled and fed up and, and tired. But then they went on the rest of the march, and if we turn over to the next relevant page, I have to do a bit of map hunt. You imagine what I'm doing in the car all this time. From Stettin, uh, then he marched, if you can see my uh, dotted line, because I've managed to trace a few villages through. A place called Caro there, which is written in the books, just tiny village. They were just walking through literally tiny villages. And if you can follow my line down, down there, uh, again, through there. We've been tracing him through, through the book. Uh, come down there and finally at a place called Felling Bostel and all the prisoners from the middle route and the northern route and I, I'm not sure but maybe some from the south route perhaps some historians can put me right on that everyone ended up at Felling Bostel and Felling Bostel was actually overcrowded very cramped and very horrible now and, and we should say as well that that march wouldn't have been the same for everyone because we was reading something was it two days ago dad wasn't it where mm. they um some of the men actually rather than just joining the northern march and staying on that they got lost they got lost in uh Gdansky, the hills of Gdansky. now i want to talk about the conditions on the march home and then joe's going to tell you how, how dad actually survived yeah. uh terrible conditions on the on the way home uh, my dad used to tell me uh, just a few stories but the chap who wrote this book has gone in, into much more detail and there's just loads in the book just just too much to cover in sort of a five minute mm. where well, it's probably been more than that time we finished yeah, but yeah. it would just be impossible to do at all but i'll read you a paragraph hundreds of men suffered from malnutrition exposure trench foot exhaustion dysentery tuberculosis and other diseases so little water was issued to us that men drank water or snow from the ground or from ditches that others had used as toilets. Men collapsed from hunger, fear, malnutrition, exhaustion or disease. Many marched along with large abscesses on their feet. Mud and cold brought phosphorite and even gangrene and amputation. Terrible conditions and my dad told me that men were shot on the march and uh, that's a very hard thing to believe even though it, 
you kind of know it's true, but it's still hard to believe. It's like like when we went to Birkenau and Auschwitz. Mm. You know it's true, but it's still hard to grasp. To fathom. And th this um, another excerpt from this book: the road from Teichol, that Stalag looked for, to Fellingbostel would always stand out in their memories as the Death March, and that's how I've always understood it from Dad. Many failed to reach the end. How many is unclear. Many men disappeared, simply disappeared along the way. Uh, one heart-rendering story is a man witnessed something that I hope to never see again. A number of POWs hid in a barn and the soldiers set the barn on fire and as some of the men ran out, they were shot as they were coming out of the flames. And he said this, I will never, never forget. <clears throat> so this was a very... Um, grueling for dad but Joe you tell them how how dad made it home so basically we know he started the march home he would have been evacuated from camp the same way everybody else was the story goes that on the march home basically along with a lot of other men he became quite ill we were possibly imagine dysentery something like that unfortunately he was shoved into a concrete pipe by a couple of his friends and left there so everybody else carried on marching and granddad stayed in the concrete pipe we don't know what sort of pipe this is whether it be sewage pipe or uh, animal uh, yeah as part of a building, <coughs> building so, site anything we, yeah, we, we don't know, know and we yeah. don't know where but, An animal conduit under a roadway perhaps we, yeah, we just don't know don't know but he basically lived in that pipe how long did he say for dad i'm not sure how long he lived in but, the pipe but a question that was asked on there was who did actually rescued dad and it was the it americans. was the americans yeah. that came along and rescued yeah. him out the pipe and yeah. he was sent home from there mm. so yeah that's how granddad survived hi, yeah hiya yeah. that is how granddad survived uh world war Two, and his long march home back to you okay thank you joe we're coming to the end of um today's live stream i'm just making sure that we haven't forgotten anything for today because there's there's some things we want to cover tomorrow dad's recovery and the rest and the rest of his life because it was important to know how that how being a pow yeah. affected him in in his life we're going to talk about why because <clears throat> uh, a lot of the things that have come up on our facebook mm. quite a few people have said about their relatives not talking about their situation or what they suffered when they mm. went home yeah I'll talk about that so tomorrow. we're going to speak about that tomorrow as yeah. well people wonder why they didn't say anything yeah We've done some research on that he that. didn't have to walk all that way so but we don't know how far mm. He walked. He where, walked. It's where the just concrete against. pipe was could literally have been anywhere between Stalag Luft Four and Fellingbostel, we think. I did read a story, again, going back to the information Ian sent me on emails that I was reading through the other day. There was a affidavit of a gent there, I think was called Frank, but don't quote me on it. He managed to escape when they were trying to catch a ferry over the river. Odor. Odor. Mm. And this is James, by the way. Hi, yeah. James. That's so nice that you, you're yeah. watching, James. That's great. Um, hopefully, Daddy will take you on a trip over here one day and you can learn all about your great granddad. That would yeah. be brilliant for you. Yeah, hi, James. You oh, can, hi, hi, you James. can yeah, cool. finish off. Yeah. Interesting to know how the whole war and the whole march home affected some people. And uh, I read in, I keep referring to this book, but it's an amazing book. Um, and We've, we found that there was one man there who read Genesis through to Revelation from the beginning to the end of the Bible Hopefully. from the time he left Stalag Luft IV from the time he arrived at Felling Bostel. That's, that gives you an idea of how long it, it took him to march that. And to me, it, it just shows how differently it can affect some men. While one man was reading his Bible, another man, my dad, was completely losing his whole faith in, mm. in God at all. So it was. It had a huge impact yeah. on the men. So thank you very much for tuning in, everyone, today. Uh, tomorrow we'll be on our way home, possibly before or more likely after we, we got off the, the ferry. We'll stop somewhere for coffee on the way home. We'll give you the last instalment and talk about um, 
Yeah, I might do it on the ferry home. Might do it on the ferry home if we've got some Wi Fi. That is how Grandad would have got home, isn't it? On the ferry. I've no idea. No, that's another thing. No. Right. Yeah. Apparently, um, thank you for that, Joe, because apparently it was quite hit and miss how people got home. It was not organised at all. Uh, from what we can gather as well. So it just all adds to the whole trauma of the thing. Bye everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Take care and we'll catch up again tomorrow.